My dear friends, this is the only Shabbat on which the assigned Torah portion is literally a number. The number eight, Shmini. It's called Shmini because on the eighth day of Moses' brother Aaron the priest's dedication ceremony, our ancestors were ready to begin their offerings to God. But something awful happens. Aaron the high priest has two sons, Nadav and Avihu, who bring offerings God had not commanded. Fire consumes Aaron's sons. Moses makes an attempt to explain why his nephews died. But Aaron is simply frozen in grief. The Torah says two words, Vayidom Aharon, and Aaron was silent. Sometimes in the face of tragedy, as we all know, there are no words. In recent weeks for funeral homes, hospitals, grief counselors, pastors who've seen more death in the past three weeks than the past three years, there are no words other than, I'm sorry. And that is why talk of relaxing our vigilance as the virus continues to spread is so hard to hear with people dying and suffering across our city and nation as we pray. The number of dead in America has nearly doubled since last Friday night service. And of the 210 countries in the world with COVID-19, one out of every three documented case is in the United States. And that's based only on just 1% of the U.S. population being tested. What does this have to do with Shemini, the number eight in Judaism, and this week's Torah portion? Eight, as you know, is a sacred number in Judaism. A healthy Jewish boy enters the covenant of our people with a bris on the eighth day. There are eight nights of Hanukkah, and infusing every Jewish ceremony and service is the musical cycle known as an octave. But the significance of the number eight is deeper than that. As we read in the Torah, and you know this, God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh day with the onset of tonight's Shabbat. But after God finished everything and rested, the rabbis say it was after day seven, on day eight, when God placed this world in our hands to build a vision of what God is all about. Love, goodness, selflessness, compassion, unity, shalom. It's as if God handed humanity the baton on day eight, placing the whole world again in our hands and waiting for us to do the most that we can with the time that we have in the place where we are, where we are in Memphis right now, there are two different narratives going on. People out east and in midtown and downtown getting cabin fever, practicing social distancing, maybe even getting tested. The second narrative is South Memphis and Whitehaven, Berkeley, Frazier, the neighborhood touching the zip code in Hickory Hill, just a few miles down the road. The good news to report from our role in the faith community's citywide task force is that 30 mobile food pantries are reaching inner city families and children in Memphis food deserts and unlike other cities where school children aren't all getting food, we have mobilized 60 sites for Shelby County school children to receive meals through the end of the summer. We will keep you posted on our role as a synagogue, as a Jewish leader and hub for food alongside Crosstown Church Health, the Catholic community, the Muslim community, the African American church community, the greater community of faith. But there is also alarming news. This week, a national evaluator came to Memphis and gave the parts of Memphis outside the Poplar Corridor a grade of D minus. 
for social distancing in the largely overcrowded neighborhoods. Social distancing is a privilege if you have space. And where there's still very little testing for COVID, our superb Memphis medical directors for COVID-19 are not worried as much about those of us in the nicer neighborhoods taking the warnings seriously. It's in the poorest communities still largely without testing where all of Memphis must double down to get people to understand that we have to hide from the virus to save lives. The surge in Memphis is still weeks away following days when we're hearing lots of talk about going back to work and how the peak has passed in New York, thank God, and other places. But this talk is not helpful for us in Memphis. While what we have done here so far is clearly helping, in the words of our TI Crosstown neighbor and task force chair, Scott Morris, we need to rise to the occasion as a faith community and as a city in the weeks ahead into May, or else we will regret that we did not do what God expects of us. Embedded in Reverend Morris's comment is my own personal Jewish theology related to Shmini and the number eight this week. You see, I do not believe that God is hiding like the virus. Rather, I believe that God is waiting for us to overcome our fears and save lives. I've been a student rabbi since 1986. I've been influenced by so many outstanding teachers and theologians, from my predecessor, Rabbi Danziger, and all the rabbis and clergy alongside me, to my amazing father, Rabbi Howard Greenstein, and conservative and orthodox rabbinic influences like Rabbis Schulweis and Greenberg. God is waiting for us, I learned from each of them. God is waiting for us to become what God's 70 names in Judaism include. Compassionate one, source of love, source of healing, the selfless one, protector, the hope. When we are selfish, xenophobic, or ignore this very time and place in which we're living as God's partner, when we turn our backs on the suffering outside our homes and choose not to be healers of shattered hearts, I believe that God weeps with us, not against us. What is God waiting for? God is not waiting for us to make more money, even though there is nothing wrong with prosperity and with that human desire, especially when financial survival is at stake for so many in our congregation and community who have lost their jobs, including several of you watching. But back to this week's Torah portion, what God is waiting for us is to be God's partner, God's helping hands in this world. Even though I'm doing tomorrow night's Zoom wedding, I've rescheduled at least four weddings to next year. And I realized the disappointment, hassle, the loss of money associated with moving weddings and bar and bat mitzvahs. After all, I'm married to an event planner. But as I told another great couple I was counseling yesterday afternoon, it's not that a wedding isn't a marriage. We know that. It's not just that a wedding isn't a marriage. It's that small deeds are big deeds. Like the incredible true story about the Jewish bride-to-be who went to purchase her wedding gown. She tried on nearly every wedding gown her size in stock, over 12 of them. And the salesperson began to lose patience as she watched the bride-to-be walk up and down the aisle in front of the mirror. And finally, in exasperation, the salesperson asked, what are you looking for? You've tried on a dozen gowns. What do you want? 
The bride-to-be smiled politely and explained, it's not the look of the gown that concerns me. I want to know what it sounds like. You see, a few years ago, my husband-to-be lost his eyesight, and I want him to hear me at his side. Isn't God waiting for that? As my seminary teacher imparted to me, isn't God waiting for our sensitivity, our deeds? I believe that God is. I believe, as my teachers at seminary taught me, that rivers of tears flow from God's eyes at all the sorrow and suffering in this world we endure and often engender. As we fill out our Amazon orders and grocery orders, let's remember that God is not like a cosmic bellhop rushing through heaven to fill our orders. God does not select us or anyone for suffering. God did not pick someone with no pre-existing conditions to get COVID-19 and die and then not pick the person in the next bed who recovered. God doesn't throw any of us into the jaws of anguish. So what does God do? God gives us the baton on the eighth day, the power to transmute matter into meaning. God creates us, sustains us, gives us the choice to transform our limited lives and the power to transform our limited lives into lasting legacies of healing and caring and generosity and love. Or, as the rabbinical school notes from theology class in Cincinnati, I came across this week, express. I believe that God addresses each of us and pleads with us, be my partner against all the hate and hopeless chaos, all the suffering and the sickness, be my partner against all the selfishness and indifference, all the punishing defeats. I need you, God says and pleads, for the sacred march. I believe that God is waiting for us and needs us to rise and repair ourselves, to rise and repair the invisible effects of the virus in our city that God needs us to rise and repair our broken nation and world. God is waiting for us not just to sing songs or say blessings or give sermons, but to go out even six feet apart and become worthy partners of blessing through our selfless actions for others. So may it be, so may we become. Amen.